Hello, my name is Jessica Reed and I am a geologist with the U.S. Geological Survey Earthquake Science Center in Menlo Park, California. Today I'm very pleased to talk with you about earthquake-induced liquefaction. In an earlier lecture we talked about the basics of liquefaction and uh, some of the things that can cause it, including landslides, earthquakes, storm waves, vibrations of any kind, anywhere where there's a pore pressure increase. And we focused on landslides because of a famous case from Oso, Washington of a catastrophic type of liquefaction called flow liquefaction. And we learned about mobility and how it's affected by flow liquefaction and how it can be extremely destructive and cause sudden events involving huge losses of human life. We also learned that flow liquefaction can only be triggered if the steady state shear strength of the soil is exceeded by the triggering stress. And in this lecture, I'm going to introduce a different type of liquefaction called cyclic liquefaction. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what it is and the ways that we can see it at the surface, the effects it has, and ways that people are trying to mitigate the hazard today. An earthquake causes a series of back and forth ground motions, which can be described as many cycles of shearing and stress reversals. With a single unidirectional loading event, like a landslide, there's only really one opportunity for liquefaction to be triggered. But during an earthquake, the prolonged ground shaking causes pore pressure to build up with every cycle without draining, and enough cycles of this can overcome the strength of the soil and cause liquefaction. And this is why cyclic liquefaction is more easily achieved during an earthquake than flow liquefaction and generally has a less catastrophic outcome. But cyclic mobility can be extremely damaging to infrastructure. And this little cartoon that I just showed is a good illustration of some of the main problems that come out of liquefaction. One is the flow and the unstable ground, and another is the subsidence. When the material eventually does subside and the water drains, it often drains up, causing many problems to infrastructure. Cyclic mobility is similar to flow liquefaction in the basics of soil strength and pore pressure. But cyclic mobility can happen where flow liquefaction won't, and there are two main reasons for this. First, since the initiating force is sustained during earth shaking, greater liquefaction effects are achieved by compounding smaller shear events, which alone would not have caused failure. Secondly, since earthquake shaking is regional, whereas landslide initiation is localized, Earthquake-induced liquefaction can occur over large regions and in different layers below the surface. This means that cyclic mobility can have surprising effects that flow liquefaction would not produce. For example, this picture on the right you see shows a house sinking into the ground in San Francisco during the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake. Some of the substrate beneath this house appears to have liquefied due to cyclic liquefaction. Phenomenon couldn't have happened due to flow liquefaction. This is pretty much the same thing we saw in the last slide, but liquefaction destabilized these huge buildings during the 1964 Niigata earthquake. Although the phenomenon had been observed before 1964, it's important to note that this event in Niigata, along with a 9.2 earthquake in Alaska of the same year, largely motivated advances in the study and contemporary understanding of liquefaction and its mechanics. Subsidence, like you see here, is just one feature of liquefaction. Another way liquefaction can appear at the surface is as sand boils or sand volcanoes. 
Another word for it is sand blows. This is a picture from also the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake in California. Here's a little cartoon. Sand boils occur when a sandy, when a layer of sandy soil, like in yellow, that is susceptible to liquefaction is overlain by clay or silt layers in red and orange. The clay layers act as a confining trap to the sand layers. And when ground motion of an earthquake causes the soil to compact and settle, the saturated layer of sand is essentially squeezed by the overlying layers and the trapped water is pressurized. Pore pressure increases and the sand is liquefied and it starts looking for a lower pressure environment to escape to. In order to accomplish this, some of the liquefied layer escapes to the surface as a sand dike and spews sandy water in a sort of volcano, which is a sand boil. This is a beautiful example of a sand boil that has been lithified and then broken to show a cross section. You can see here the dike that fed the sand boil breaking apart the overlying layers. Another feature of cyclic liquefaction is buoyancy. As in liquid, uh, objects sink and float in the liquefied sand depending on relative density. This not so dense a manhole actually floated to the surface during soil liquefaction in the Chuetsu earthquake of 2004 in Niigata, Japan. Sewers and fuel tanks and other surprising things that have been buried have also been known to resurface during earthquakes. On the other hand, other denser objects like cars and buildings have been observed to sink. One of the most destructive features of cyclic liquefaction is lateral spreading, shown here alongside a road. Lateral spreading can cause damage to rigid structures like roads, bridges, buildings, ports, and pipes. During an earthquake, a sandy layer and underneath these structures might liquefy and flow elsewhere, maybe simply downhill due to gravity or maybe in reaction to something heavy on top of it. The rigid layers of soil and the structures above will be pulled apart or crunched together at the whim of the underlying sand layer. This is another example of lateral spreading, which caused the Shawa Bridge to pull apart and collapse. This process can be relatively slow and is certainly slower than the effects of catastrophic flow liquefaction, so it is less dangerous to humans, but it can cause tremendous damage to necessary structures and is one major contributor to the high cost of earthquake damage, and it is also fairly dangerous. Far, I've been framing the discussion of two types of liquefaction as flow liquefaction, which is triggered by landslides, and cyclic liquefaction, which is triggered by earthquakes. But of course, this is a simplified view, and these ge geohazards are often linked. Earthquakes often trigger extremely destructive landslides, which can in turn trigger flow liquefaction. Let's look at a few historic earthquake-triggered landslides. Here in the Sichuan province of China, the 2008 Wenchuan earthquake triggered thousands of slope failures. Here you can see the high density of landslides near the river on the right after the earthquake. Around 20,000 people were killed by earthquake-triggered landslides alone. The landslides from the Wenchuan earthquake were so intense, in fact, that the river was dammed by a landslide deposit and a lake formed flooding buildings nearby. This region is really vulnerable to slope failure because of steep mountains and high seismicity and rainfall. A magnitude 7.9 earthquake 
like the Winchwan earthquake, was enough to trigger thousands of devastating rock falls, high-speed landslides, and debris flows. But this earthquake also triggered cyclic liquefaction, which caused sand boils, like you see in the upper right-hand picture, subsidence of buildings, which you see in the bottom pictures, and also lateral spreading. The Wenchuan earthquake exhibited liquefaction up to 20 meters deep. On September 30th, in 2009, a magnitude 7.6 earthquake occurred off the coast near Padang. The event killed over 1,000 people and triggered massive landslides, which account for about 60% of the fatalities. Contiguous seismic activity is expected in the area, so it's really important that we understand these landslide events in preparation for future hazards. The landslides occurred in very saturated soil. The graph here on the lower right shows rainfall prior to the earthquake and landslide events. You can see that the area experienced elevated levels of precipitation leading up to the event. The upper right figure is a simplified geologic map with little red dots showing landslides. Most of the slides were focused in the quaternary volcanic rocks. There has been some, but not much study of liquefaction of volcanic soils like these. It was concluded that the saturation in the soil was critical to landslide failure and that even smaller earthquakes could trigger similar landslides if saturation requirements are met. On October 8, 2005, a magnitude 7.6 earthquake struck northern Pakistan. The event killed at least 86,000 people and triggered several thousand slope failures, primarily rock falls and rock slides, although it also triggered many debris flows and mud flows. Evidence of liquefaction was observed in sand boils and ground cracks and a lot of damage to structures and roads was likely caused by liquefaction. Here you can see a diagram and a photo of the same event, which is a sand boil thought to have been caused by the 2005 earthquake. You can see the characteristic dike feeding upwards to the sand boil on top. Liquefaction susceptibility is an important assessment in areas where liquefaction has occurred or is expected to occur, especially in areas near rivers, bays, coasts, areas with high populations and a lot of structures and roads, and areas that have been altered considerably during construction. San Francisco experienced high liquefaction during the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake. I've already shown you several photos of sand boils and uh, subsidence and buoyancy from this event. San Francisco was built on quite a lot of liquefaction prone material, including artificial fill. It also sits on a seismically active zone near a transformed fault with a triple junction just 250 kilometers north. This is part of a USGS liquefaction susceptibility map of the San Francisco Bay Area. You can see liquefaction susceptibility has been divided into five categories from very low to very high. And also note that very high liquefaction susceptibility is concentrated around rivers and right next to the bay. I've also included another photo from the Loma Prieta earthquake event uh, illustrating buoyancy. This is a simplified chart that shows geologic units um, according to their liquefaction susceptibility. You can see that artificial landfill was found to be very susceptible to liquefaction. Younger sediments also tended to be more susceptible 
as well as sandy beach and estuary deposits. You can see that the historical sediments are the very most susceptible to liquefaction, whereas pre-quaternary units are really not very susceptible. Although a field examination and a an analysis of map units is important to understanding the liquefaction susceptibility of a certain region. In the case of an earthquake, a quick liquefaction susceptibility prediction can be generated. The USGS Earthquake Hazards Program uses a model based on the work of Zhu et al. 2017, which takes as environmental inputs, the distance from the coasts and rivers, the mean annual precipitation, and the water table depth. And it also takes inputs of peak ground velocity of the earthquake and shear wave velocity. And this can output a liquefaction probability map as well as broad risk predictions for number of people affected, as well as the severity and spatial extent of liquefaction. If possible and necessary, steps can be taken to improve stability of the soil and reduce the chances of earthquake-induced liquefaction. Different methods of soil improvement have been used, um, and they're based on the cost and effectiveness with a certain kind of sediment. I've put a list here of some of the common strategies for improving the strength of the soil. Densification, drainage, reinforcement, compensation, removal and replacement of the soil, and confinement. And these are all just trying to strengthen the soil against cyclic liquefaction. One method, densification, is often the practice of compacting the soil. The idea is that the soil compacts during liquefaction, going from large pore space to smaller pore space. And if the area is pre-compacted before the event, then the change in pore space doesn't occur and pore pressure doesn't increase, which means liquefaction is less likely to happen. This image at the top of the slide shows something called dynamic compaction, uh, during which a uh, weight of 10,000 to 40,000 kilograms is dropped in free fall from a height of usually 15 to 40 meters. This is done in a grid pattern like you see to the right. Different colors represent different rounds of compaction. For example, orange might be the first pass, then gray, and then finally pale green. The method of dynamic compaction can densify sands up to 10 meters. Um, another type of compaction uses vibration to jostle the sediment grains into an optimal arrangement. Vibrocompaction works well on sands but poorly on silt or clay, whereas dynamic compaction works well on a small range of sizes. There are also reinforcement methods that include using end bearing piles instead of friction piles. The friction piles are shown on the right of this bottom left diagram and rely on the stability of the soil to hold it in place. And if that soil is liquefied, a friction pile is ineffective. Whereas an end bearing pile relies on the strength of a deeper, less susceptible material. Other kinds of soil stabilization include various styles of grouting, pre-wetting, heating and freezing the soil, reinforcing material with columns or jagged gravel that won't shift as easily. However, it should really be noted that soil stabilization can be very expensive and often has to be done before construction in an area begins. In many cases, relocation, or reduced utilization of an area is the safer and cheaper option. So I've put a quick summary here of what we talked about. First, we talked about cyclic liquefaction, how it can happen when flow liquefaction won't because the reversing cycles of stress of earthquake ground motion 
can build pore pressure with every repetition. We talked about all of the interesting and often destructive ways that cyclic liquefaction can manifest, like buoyant fuel tanks and sewers, sinking buildings, sand boils, and lateral spreading, breaking bridges. Then we went over some historical examples of landslide triggered earthquakes and the role of liquefaction in those events. And finally, we went over liquefaction susceptibility mapping, earthquake liquefaction modeling, and some of the many, many methods that geotechnical engineers can use to strengthen soil and prevent cyclic liquefaction.